We are here to discuss um, in a panel, uh, in improvised panel discussion, the aspects of the Starshot project that uh, uh, would uh, relate to instrumentation uh, in trying to probe um, first targets in the solar system, then the interstellar medium, and eventually uh, the target stars, uh, planetary systems around stars nearby. Uh, and I should say this is a very ambitious uh, project. Um, we decided about moving at 20% of the speed of light because the median age of the advisory committee is about 50. Uh, one member of the advisory committee uh, is in his 80s, uh, and he recommended that we move faster so that he will be able to witness uh, the, the accomplishments of the project during his lifetime. Um, it should basically represent the life expectancy of the members of the advisory committee. Um, so um, we have a, a number of uh, distinguished members of this uh, panel. Uh, Harry Atwater from uh, Caltech, Russ Belikov, uh, from NASA Ames, Jim Benford from Microwave uh, Sciences, Sciences. Um, Blakesley Burkhardt from Harvard University, and Jeff Kuhn from uh, the University of Hawaii. And uh, we'll discuss various aspects uh, of the project. Um, before we start, uh, some people uh, asked me and uh, members of the panel about uh, how would an image look like uh, from the vantage point of a relativistic spacecraft. And I wanted to ask uh, Russ if he can uh, show us a video of what uh, he calculated the image to look like from sure. a very fast uh, spacecraft. So how do I, I guess uh, I need to fire this up. Or will you do it there? Okay. Um, I think this one is a clicker, right? No. That one? Press the green button. All right. So I, I got uh, interested in uh, kind of figuring out what uh, uh, a planet would look like on camera as you're flying by it. Uh, and I didn't see, uh, you know, I Googled it and nobody had really done it, so I decided to do it. And this one, okay. And so what I'm going to show you is uh, a telescope flying by. Uh, and here's the geometry. Now I, uh, it's flying by at a 0.9 the speed of light to exaggerate the relativistic effects. And um, so in a Newtonian universe, this is what it's gonna look like. So just flying by normally, no surprises. Uh, now there are two effects here. There's the relativistic effect and there's also the light travel delays. And if we just look at the light travel delays, uh, this is what it would look like, so in a Newtonian universe, but a real camera image. So you can see that the image is elongated, and this is because if you have a, uh, so this is your spacecraft, uh, and there's something flying by it, the light from here uh, is in the past, and the light from, uh, from here is kind of closer to, to, to your time. So uh, just like, you know, the farther you look, the more in the past you look. So this one, uh, actually uh, is, you know, it, it's, there's a shear happening because this part of, of the planet you see uh, at an earlier time. Um, so you see this elongation effect basically as, as we're passing by. Uh, and if we move to uh, our universe, the relativistic universe, the actual object, that's what it looks like. You see the Lorentz contraction. So the whole space-time kind of shrinks uh, as you're flying by it. But if you combine this with um, the slight travel delay effect that I showed uh, in the previous movie, then the resulting image that you see is this here, uh, which shows up, the two effects exactly cancel out, so you see uh, a disk, uh, meaning that in a single image, the Lorentz contraction is actually invisible. You cannot see it. Uh, and, but what you can detect is, first of all, at the closest approach, if you remember from the previous image, India was in your kind of field of view, and now it's Africa. And this is because if you combine the Lorentz contraction with a shear, it looks like a rotation. So um, Africa is now in your uh, field of view at closest approach. And also, if you look at uh, 
how the size, your apparent angular size of the image changes as a function of time, uh, that is different in a relativistic universe and in a Newtonian universe, and that curve uh, can betray that you're in a relativistic universe, even though you cannot directly see the Lorentz contraction. So. Thank you very much, uh, Russ. So we'll start the discussion uh, with uh, the following question. Uh, I would like to ask each of the panelists, what is your favorite uh, uh, experiment or, or data collection device or instrument um, that, uh, and what is the property of, of, of the planetary system that you would uh, like to probe that cannot be probed uh, remotely or uh, that is very difficult to probe remotely. So let's start with Harry. Well, I guess uh, I'll start from the uh, viewpoint of uh, uh, s some of the requests that were made by uh, astronomers in the, in the last panel and last uh, discussion. And uh, it seemed to me being able to take spectra, even though images are uh, the iconic uh, sort of records of space missions, that spectra are very important. And I think I'm quite optimistic that with the uh, sort of exponential character of the growth of photonics technology that we're going to be able to see the capability to make within the mass budget of the Starshot spacecraft, uh, multispectral and even hyperspectral imaging. Uh, so the last, uh, one of the last speakers, uh, Laura, was asking for uh, essentially a hyperspectral image. I think that's very foreseeable that we can build, uh, uh, certainly we, they're not available today, uh, but I think it's uh, within the realm of possibility over the scope of this mission or this program to uh, uh, imagine that we'll have uh, ability to do hyperspectral imaging out to the limits of the band gap of an image sensor or maybe even using uh, detectors, thermal detectors, uh, into the mid-IR and far-IR. Thank you, Harry. Russ? So aside from uh, measuring relativistic effects, uh, which I guess you can do flying by our own Earth in the solar system, um, I think one of the key um, advantages of a flyby is that it becomes much easier to resolve continents on, on a planet and uh, to, to kind of image it in high definition even. Uh, and of course, uh, there, you can do that remotely, either with uh, using the sun as a gravity lens in, in principle or by inverting the light curves uh, as Svetlana showed uh, uh, yesterday. Um, and, but, that, but both of those are clearly challenging uh, as, as well. So, um, and uh, if, if, you know, clearly if you fly by, a planet at close range, then even with a very simple you know, camera, you can take high definition images of continents. Jim? I think the most important thing to the, to the scientifically, but also to the great public, is going to be the images. And there's a real problem about that. Let me tell you a story. In 1986, I was at JPL as part of a vast number of people who were observing the flyby of Uranus. This photograph came up. It really astonished people. This is Miranda, a moon of Uranus. It, Miranda has had a hard life. <laughs> it's been kicked around. It looks like God hit it with a sledgehammer. It was a big surprise. Then uh, three years later, a flyby of Neptune, and we saw this. This is Triton, with two different, completely different landscapes, and no one at the time had any idea what this was about. And regret to say, we know very little more about these, these worlds since, because we haven't been back. I think that the name of this session, which is, um, we're to talk about the scientific uh, uh, goals and instrumentation. We must remember that for 99.99% of the public, this isn't about science, this is about exploration. And what they really mean and what they really notice is the pictures. And I think there's a real problem with getting pictures that Claire Max pointed out in our last meeting last August that it's a, it's a difficult return. And we have now identified that as a major area. And I want to highlight the implications because it has, it funnels down into an implication for all the rest of the instruments. It's this. Basically, to get enough, uh, enough bits back 
from the photons we receive, the photon, the few photons we receive, we're going to have to compress pulses. We're going to have to send it back in pulses. And the key thing is the peak to average power ratio. In other words, peak it up and squeeze the information down into a short pulse duration. That, in my understanding, is not what we do in returning data from spacecraft today. And so it will place requirements on the instrumentation, or rather on the way an instru instrumentation's data will be handled. And I'll talk about a couple aspects of that. You see, the bits per photon that you get goes as the log to base two of the peak to the average power. For example, if your uh, peak to average power ratio is two to the 10th, then you get 10 bits per photon. And uh, things like this, the rates like this, 10 bits per photon. Most people would think you can never get any more bits th than one from a photon. But we routinely do in some applications now because of uh, signal processing, th things that come out of the great advances that have occurred in, uh, the, um, in, uh, signal, uh, in, in electronics in the last uh, 40, 50 years. The, uh, for example, there's more signal processing in your cell phone than the entire El Apollo program used. The, uh, uh, and and the, specifically, uh, we're going to have to use pulse time modulation techniques and to get up the, uh, the bits we get back. And um, a way to see that is we've got to take what would be long trains of information, or at least long in duration, and squeeze them into higher peak power and this is actually more energy efficient. And it means that the data that comes out has to be stored and then released in a short time scale. There are a lot of ways to do this electronically. You can use um, uh, ferromagnetics. You can use all kinds of circuits. And this is done in various applications of electronics all the way from milliwatts to terawatts already. But that's going to have to be added into spacecraft. And, and instrumentation will be affected by that. So that's my message. Thank you, Jim. Blexley? So I guess this is on. Yeah, great. Um, the first thing maybe to mention is that we don't have to pick and choose, right? With Starshot, we get multiple chances to send instrumentation, whether it's to uh, uh, Alpha Centauri or a solar system mission or even a mission that's designed to study our local interstellar medium. And so we can actually tailor each individual craft to a different science goal, right? And so I think it's great that we really keep that in mind when we talk about what science instruments that we want to eventually choose because we actually can potentially choose many of them, right? We don't have to make too many sacrifices in terms of uh, mission goals. So personally, what's my favorite? Um, I study the interstellar medium, and I study in particular magnetic fields and turbulence in the interstellar medium. So if you have to ask me what my favorite would be, it would be the magnetic fields in a, a magnetometer on the starship. Um, magnetic fields in uh, astrophysics, uh, in the astrophysics community are actually sort of an unpopular topic. Uh, there's a saying that uh, if you don't understand it, blame magnetic fields, right? Um, but in fact, as we've heard today and, and yesterday, a magnetic field uh, is a critical component to the habitability of a planet. Uh, if you don't have a magnetic field around your planet, then you have really nothing to shield you from, uh, uh, from a solar wind, right? And so detecting magnetic fields uh, around planets uh, would be a critical um, thing, I think, for the Starship to have. Uh, another aspect of magnetic fields that would be very interesting is, is measuring them directly uh, in the interstellar medium during the flyby, or during the cruise phase. Uh, that's the 20-year the time period that the star uh, uh, chip and the sail will be cruising through the interstellar medium. Uh, it is basically uh, impossible or very difficult to make uh, remote measurements of magnetic fields. Essentially, our only tool for that uh, is the, for direct measurements is the Zeeman effect. Um, and of course, that's the, the splitting of spectral lines um, which, which gives us some proxy for the, the magnetic field measurement. Um, but basically, you have to do this directly. And so that would be a huge leap forward for our understanding of magnetic fields in the interstellar medium uh, if we were able to put a, a magnetometer on the starship and during that cruise phase make direct measurements of the magnetic field. Thanks, Blakesley. Jeff? So here's a, <clears throat> I'm a practical kind of guy. Here's a, here's a fun fact. 
the total number of photons that we can collect from this maybe one meter aperture flyby for an hour, uh, even though it's several hundred times several hundred thousand times closer to the planet than our beamer and our receiver on the Earth, is about the same as the number of photons we'll collect from this one kilometer array operating over the lifetime of the flight. So to the extent that we're collecting information by photons, we mustn't forget the receiver, which is sitting there doing nothing for most of the time, because the number of photons it picks up will be equal to the one we get from each flyby of, of, the, of the nanochip. So when I think about that and I think about the experiments that I'd like to do, well, there's a whole bunch of them from the ground, and I think the other lesson from this meeting today has been that the angular resolution is an important number, but it doesn't really define the smallest angular scale that we can learn things about prox B, for example. And we saw examples of that in, in Svetlana's talk and, and others. So to me, that says that, that the nanochip really is powerful because of its in situ measurements. And, and all of these are great. I'm, I'm a big fan of the magnetic field measurement. We should be measuring the particle flux um, in that environment. That, that's important. But something was mentioned at an earlier meeting which really resonates with me, which is the in situ, very, very remote possibility of measuring Life. Okay, so we're, we're into this business of picking technologies that are exponentiating and using them. And so what's, what's a great example of an exponentiating technology? Well, one of them is the, the cost per million base pairs in sequencing. And as you know, that's gone down from something like several thousand dollars per million base pairs to a, a hundredth of a penny. So I'm a big fan of somehow slowing this down so that we can capture something in the environment of the solar system and do some DNA sequencing. I'm also, and this is a, an even much simpler experiment. Um, you may know from the long duration um, experiments for space exposure that there, there are bacterial spores that are known to live at least six years. So uh, Bacillus uh, subtilis um, forms a protein uh, casing and goes into hibernation and as far as we know is, is perfectly happy traveling in space. I think it would be fun on one of these disposable chips to put, put a little colony of bacillus, um, uh, send it for 20 years, uh, turn it on, give it some nutrients and see if it's still alive. Just to experimentally decide whether or not panspermia works over, over interstellar distances. And, and by the way, we know that there are interstellar carriers. The Oort cloud easily transfers material from one solar system to another. So I'm really enthused by the possibility of the in situ measurements. The magnetic field is, is one, the particles, um, and the possibility of measuring material properties, even biological material properties in the environment. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, there is no doubt that this is an ambitious project that will take a lot of research and development to uh, bring to fruition. Uh, I wanted to ask each of you, what do you see as the major, or the main technological uh, challenge, um, and uh, how do you foresee uh, the way of overcoming that challenge? And uh, maybe with Harry, I would like to suggest, since we heard a lot about the sale, uh, if you can educate us about the latest advances in materials, and what do you foresee as, uh, as Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, my first question was, are there any materials that can be used to make a light sail? Uh, and I think, uh, to some level of satisfaction, I was able to convince myself that the answer is yes. Um, but the class of materials are fairly special, and they're, they're uh, what I would call fairly extreme materials in terms of uh, the most important property of the material is that it have very low optical absorption. Uh, so, but of course, uh, by the reciprocity of the radiation law, we know that if something has low optical absorption, it also has low emittance as well. And emission, thermal emission, is the only mechanism we have to cool the sail. Uh, so what we really want is something which is very low absorption at the laser wavelength, but black at every other wavelength. Uh, so that is quite special. And uh, we can make materials, uh, so we want to start with materials that are insulators for, uh, to first order. Uh, wideband gap semiconductors and insulators, I think, uh, will end up 
coming to the fore as, as candidates for the basic sale material. That, and we can make such things that have uh, very high reflectivity. Uh, I did a sort of simple back of the envelope calculation in about 10 minutes, convinced myself that we could make something with the prescribed thickness that had been mentioned in many of the papers uh, with about four layers that could get to three nines reflectivity uh, within the laser band. <clears throat> but uh, then we also need to have something that is, uh, has some finite emittance somewhere at other wavelengths. So there are important questions that we need to answer uh, about the materials and uh, particularly also the scale at which we're talking about making materials, which is of the order of a few tens to a few hundred nanometers thick over tens of square meters with essentially uh, exquisite precision and uniformity. That's, that's something that hasn't really been done uh, uh, at this scale before. So there are a lot of important challenges, but I think I'm pretty encouraged by the uh, basic possibility of making the sale that will be stable from a materials point of view. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Russ? So I guess uh, one of the challenges I see, well, um, one of the main challenges I see is related to, to Harry's, which is the um, uniformity and, and the stability um, of, of the, the force on, on the sale. But in addition to the kind of having uh, un uniform reflectivity, uh, we also have to make sure that the laser itself is uniform. Uh, and um, so that uh, seems, I mean, it's, it should be physically possible, but it seems like it's, it's an engineering challenge. And uh, the types of numbers we're talking about uh, as Phil showed many times, I think, is that we have um, accelerations uh, of um, some 50,000 or 60,000 Gs. So that means that one part in 60,000 non-uniformity would result in a 1G gradient um, somewhere across uh, the, the solar sail. And I think, uh, um, you know, th these are, uh, can a, can a solar sail withstand a 1G gradient? Thank you. Solar sails can't, but this is not a solar sail. Far from it, in fact. Jim. Or many orders of magnitude different acceleration. I think, it, in fact, they're going to be, we should expect substantial variations, like factors of two over a distance between you and me mm -hmm. uh, in force. And therefore, the tensile strength of the material is going to be a very important thing. And when you talk about something that's 10 nanometers, something you can't see <laughs> the thick that you gotta, you got to wonder is um, you, got, you can take a material that will, uh, uh, you might be able to survive the first uh, uh, microsecond of the acceleration, but it has to survive the entire acceleration all the way through with all these variations and the, the transit out to Alpha C, and then, of course, the flyby, and there are many impediments in the way it will face. So I think the material is extremely difficult, and, but all aspects of Starshot have that level of difficulty in common, unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon which side of the problem you are on. Thank you. Next me. I, I look at this from a kind of systems integrated perspective because you can point out individual problems with Starshot, right? So it was already mentioned the issue of the beam stability or how is this sail going to survive something on the order of 60,000 Gs? Um, how are we going to be able to communicate the data back? Um, but if you even if you look at how all of those individual problems integrate into a whole, you have an even bigger problem, right? And, and that's um, you know, how the Starshot system will go from start to finish as a success. Um, and I think we have to keep in mind that we have to communicate each of these individual components within the system, right? And so if someone is just thinking about how do we make the beamer work, and then someone over here is thinking, oh, okay, how, how am I going to do the material side of the sail? And those two people don't communicate to each other because the sail and the beamer are ultimately one, one system to be successful. If that's not happening, then the whole project, I think, will be, will be in trouble. And so we really have to think um, carefully about each of these individual problems, right? And then how they integrate as a whole. And that's why we have a subcommittee for system integration. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Jeff. So I think I think Kevin maintains a spreadsheet, and 
for each category, he's got a multiplier for how many orders of magnitude we have to go from present to the time when we launch this. And of course, your question is, is really probing the statement, ignorance is bliss. And, and I'm ignorant about a lot of the problems. So in fact, the problem I, I care about and that I think therefore is the most difficult I, is, is still the receiver problem. That, that the, there's, on Kevin's spreadsheet, we have as many orders of magnitude in, in reaching this one kilometer phased receiver. I think as we do in almost every other category, except maybe knowing how we're gonna phase the lasers. But I, the other thing that, that, that pulls me into this problem is the fact that there, there are clearly categories where we're ripe for progress. And, and the, the optical problem is ripe for progress. We make mirrors the same way we did 100 years ago, effectively. And, and we still think of telescopes as separate from the instruments that are used to detect and do the, the, the contrast problems that we're, we're, we're all interested in. And I think it's time, and maybe Breakthrough can do it, to, to integrate the telescope to the instrument and build, build and, and here's a clear case of it, the receiver is really the first time that we would consider building what is effectively a telescope, designed for specifically that problem, and it has to be if it's ever gonna achieve it. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm most interested and concerned about that problem, but I'm really telling you what my ignorance is. I have a question uh, or a comment on that point. Um, if, say, say we don't solve the receiver problem, but we solve all the other problems, would, in your opinion, uh, it be enough to have Starshot Go ahead. If we could send this probe, and knowing that we would never get any data back, just that we could actually accelerate something, size scale well, of a gram to 20% of the speed well, of light, maybe would that we, be enough? Maybe we could get something back. Remember that, that each one of these is equivalent to uh, maybe 100 kiloton. I, your figure was 10, but I got a 100 kiloton blast. So it's, it's several times bigger than Hiroshima or, or and if we could string out a bunch of these or merv them properly, maybe we could set it up so that with all of our ground-based telescopes, we could get the self-destructive signal that said, yeah, we made it. And, and it, it might start interstellar warfare, but, but it, it would, <laughs> would satisfy it, it. It's one way of sending a message to outer <laughs> space. Um, now, uh, I would like to ask the last question before we open uh, the floor for discussion. Uh, um, and um, I wanted to bring this project in a, a, a bigger context, the context of centuries from now. I um, mean, this is really the very first time that a project to visit other stars uh, is being funded, and it's funded, at least for the feasibility study, at a, le at a very high level, $100 million. Um, and so the question is, do you, what do you foresee it uh, as uh, in, in, in the bigger context of several centuries from now, do, do you see that as the first step towards a much more advanced technology that we will ultimately achieve in moving away from the solar system and reaching other places? And uh, please uh, allow yourself to be uh, a little less conservative than usual in that context. Go ahead. Well, I, I think uh, there, there are a number of uh, exponential technologies that are coming together in a very synergistic way. One is uh, the ability to create large uh, amounts of power using uh, photovoltaics, and we can now do this uh, cheaper than ever before. Uh, the exponential cost decline is not <clears throat> as rapid as it was for silicon electronics, but over the last 25 years, the price of photovoltaics has dropped by uh, several orders of magnitude. Furthermore, we're getting to the point where we can uh, uh, make these tech, uh, photovoltaic arrays uh, light enough to uh, have the cost of launch be uh, uh, reasonable, essentially at the cost, same as the cost of the manufacturer of the photovoltaics. So then putting that together with the possibility of a laser system, you can think about uh, perhaps building uh, remotely and other uh, on the moon and other uh, on spacecraft uh, systems for doing uh, light-driven uh, 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 space transport uh, over as, a, as a sort of versatile utility. Well, I guess some, some people are already discussing that with respect to Mars, like Elon Musk. Um, 
go ahead. So it's, it's hard to project what kinds of technologies we're going to have centuries from now. I mean, if you look at uh, a couple of centuries ago, if we, if we were to ask people then to predict <coughs> what we're going to have now, they would be completely off most of the time. So I'm wary of uh, predicting things, you know, that specific technologies. But I would hope that a couple of centuries from now, uh, humanity would be spacefaring uh, because uh, there are a, a few you know, celebrities, including Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, are fond of, fond of saying that uh, if we don't you know, expand out, uh, uh, then humanity uh, is doomed to, to die on Earth with the next uh, global cataclysm, uh, you know, either sooner or later, because Earth is not eternal. So this is the only way to to uh, achieve, you know, the longevity of the human species is to become a spacefaring civilization. And so, uh, uh, while I don't know that what technologies will do that, I hope that this is what what we will be a couple of centuries from now. And I think projects like uh, Breakthrough Starshot are uh, one small step towards a direction. So I think what what will What's important to achieve that, and for, for you know for that to 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 happen, is that there has to be some kind of a market um, developed in space, and uh, I'm hoping that you know the the uh, the fact that uh, entrepreneurs like you know Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are uh, investing into space, hopefully that's a sign that they see uh, an emerging market there. Uh, that will uh, th that will develop and will, will cause a Moore's law type of uh, technology development for space and eventually interstellar travel, uh, and um, so that's that's the the path I hope we will take. Thank you, Russ. Oh, I completely agree. I think the big <laughs> impact of Starshot is going to be oh, the opening of the solar system. Starshot is aiming at a velocity that's a thousand times greater than any velocity that we've achieved, and that's with sun diver missions into the sun, which is about 67 kilometers a second. Uh, three orders of magnitude is about as much improvement as we've made since the Roman Empire, okay? And speed is associated with the growth of civilization. Most of you wouldn't be here if we didn't have jet aircraft, right? And 50 years ago, you couldn't have gotten here except by a slow propeller plane. Velocity matters. It allows us to do things like explore the outer solar system uh, rather quickly, uh, as opposed to the Voyagers, which took decades to get through their missions. And we've been out there only with, only with five spacecraft to ever visit the outer solar system. And now we can also think of, of delivering very high value, low mass things quickly around the solar system. If you have a Mars colony and you've got an epidemic and you need a virus, you need the antidote, that, well, you're not going to 3D print biological materials, not in the near term, and so you're going to have to send something. And it may weigh only a fraction of a gram, but you can get that there in two weeks or two days, depending upon how far along we are on Starshot. So we should think of Starshot in terms of a ladder of development. We're going to go to higher velocities at first, and then higher, and then higher, and then eventually, uh, we're going to find new applications for those higher velocities, and so we're going to have to have more cargo, and so we're going to have to have more power and heavier s s sailcraft. And so uh, 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 in the long term, Starshot will be the lowest mass beamed <laughs> sail, and the real money is going to be in the heavy stuff, just as the real money in travel right now is passengers, which are pretty heavy, uh, but of course cargo as well. So I think the long-term development of the solar system is going to be enabled by this technology. And so if we don't get the star shot we're working for 100 years, we'll have still changed civilization. Thank you, Jim. Lexley? I think if you want to learn something about the future, you have to study the past, right? And so look back at the Apollo missions, right? And starting in the 50s, everyone would have said, this is crazy. You can't put people on the moon. How will you do that? There's no technology developed for that. It's, it's pure lunacy, right, to put a man on the lunar surface. And, uh, and then, of course, the technology developed. People worked very hard. Um, major advances took place, and we did it, right? And in a very short 
time span from when the project was initially envisioned to when its success actually took place, right? And so right now, we're sort of sitting analogously at the start of the Apollo mission, right? Except instead of the moon, now we want to go to the stars. Um, and so we have a, a, a vision for how we think that might go, right? And we know the initial steps for the research and development that we need to take place. Um, and then that will change as the project um, eventually realizes its, its goal. Um, and so right now our goals, we think, sound crazy, right? Like 20% the speed of light going to a star system that's a little bit more than a parsec away. Um, but in the very future, right, in the far future, people might look back and say, oh, wow, so those initial you know, visionary steps were key for making the whole project happen, right? Um, ultimately, in centuries, right, centuries from now, what would we like to do? We'd like to be out exploring the galaxy. How many people here are like Star Trek? Show of hands. Probably most of the room, right? Like, this is the dream, right? We want to boldly go where no one's gone before. Um, and, and this is our, as far as we know it, with our current technology, Starshot is our best chance to do that. And we have to start somewhere. Thank you, Blexley. But, but what if, crazy, what, what if the reason why we don't hear anything in the universe is because it's a natural consequence of evolution everywhere that we evolve to a point where we get beyond this sort of messy protein-based life that we are. And there are plenty of people that talk about that now. Um, I, I, I think that this issue of, of what's, well, you're asking the question, is there a lasting legacy to Starshot? And, I, and I, I firmly believe that there is, regardless of which of these impossible problems really end up being impossible, in part because from my generation, I, I, I think that I've learned that governments don't really do important things. It's all been done by private individuals and big, big private projects. The major telescopes, all of the world's leading telescopes were, were private enterprises. And, and that's more true now than it ever was. And this is just an example of, of that. And for every one of these orders of magnitude problems that we, 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 we push back into the weeds, I, th I think there'll be plenty of accelerated development that, in my view, takes us closer to the point where evolution is really very different than it is. We keep thinking of evolution as if we're going to send cargo. Jim, I, I do believe we'll be 3D printing, and it's not very far away, the, the proteins that we need somewhere else. We're going to send not a cargo of, of proteins, but we're going to send a, a base pair code. And, and those ideas are almost upon us now. And, and their exponential technology. So I think that this issue of what Starshot actually does is really secondary to the orders of magnitude improvement in the, in the problems that we're, we're talking about now. That we're Thank you, Jeff. Um, I don't have my cell phone with me, otherwise I would have checked if uh, Trump tweeted on your comment on governments. Uh, but we'll open the uh, discussion to the audience and uh, we'll go with questions. Uh, let's start with Jill. Uh, and actually, I'll throw the ball. Can you catch? Yeah. Watch the glass. <laughs> so um, we've been talking about the information we can get from successful uh, missions where they send back information. But can't, if we've got, if we think about this as a swarm, can't we learn something about the space between us and uh, the Proxima system or the, the, the um, stellar environment? from the failure rate of these individual? Only if we know how it failed. I mean, if you don't get, the absence of signal is only a signal of absence. <laughs> it doesn't tell you why it didn't, you never well, heard from it again. Suppose, suppose every single one fails at the same distance, either distance out or distance from the you target suspect a or barrier. time or yeah, the information you have is the, the time and the distance, as, as Jill says. And so what can you infer from that? You'd have verified the zoo hypothesis. Mm -hmm. large, large grain dust, so dust grains of 15 microns or larger, will basically be fatal to a one gram spacecraft. Um, we have a paper out with Tian Huang, uh, who's in the audience, and Avi Loeb and Alex Lazarian, 
um, where we basically suggest that, um, that those large grains will be detrimental. We don't know the composition of the oort cloud very well. We don't know the grain size distribution, although we think the large grains should be very rare. Um, we still, it's just not clear, and so that's certainly a possibility. So one, one way to protect your planet against, against the invasion by nanocrafts is to embed it in a dust cloud. Um, go ahead. Uh, so just a, a couple of uh, quick comments. Uh, on our NASA program, there's a, a number of heliophysicists who are very interested in this measurement of dust grain distribution, which we can measure until the point where we run into something really big. But we will get uh, dust grain distributions in different distances. It's a, a highly anisotropic distribution, as, as you know. I, I want to comment on one quick thing that Jeff mentioned. I, I took it out of my slides because I didn't want to creep people out. Um, but a part of our program, at least on the NASA side, because we haven't cleared this with breakthrough yet, is actually to put organisms to sleep uh, in stasis mode. And there are certain organisms known as C. elegans, which we're going to embed human DNA into and send them out and then awaken them on Perfect. arrival. However, I expect that will be a highly controversial thing. To Kurt do. Vonnegut wrote about it 40 years ago. Yes, he did, yeah. He did. Well, he, he paved the way then. Um, but we have a, a collaboration with our biology department. These things actually survived the shuttle, the last shuttle uh, disaster. Yeah. They were on board. They came down. They survived. Um, they can be put to get to sleep for decades, as has been done, yeah. and they can be woken. And it's actually an interesting way to transport biological uh, activity. Yeah. So we could, and May, May Jemison would love to say something now, and I won't say it for her because we're on public TV, I guess, but we can be the panspermia which actually seeds um, uh, other planets if we want. And it's something to think about for the future. The, there is a question behind you if you can throw the box. Yeah. If you don't worry about radiation. Oh. Uh, yes. I would like to ask uh, another important uh, scientific question. So it is about the, uh, to study the composition of interstellar dust. So, so far, all the composition of dust in local interstellar medium we learn from like uh, satellites, Ulysses, uh, Galileo. So Starshot will be an excellent tool so that we can study the composition of interstellar dust. And we can compare and understand the evolution of dust from interstellar medium to the local interstellar medium. And it has uh, important implications for understanding the formation of uh, our solar planets. Thank you. Um, there is a comment here. Well, I guess we'll get to you later. Comment or question? No, go ahead. OK. Uh, I was about the instrument package. I mean, I think um, Professor Lupin had an interesting point that the um, outer solar systems, an interesting target, potentially. So maybe rather than overthinking the instrumentation to get it exactly right, you, you, you send a package to Pluto. You've you, all you're doing is snipping out the pesky 20-year you know, cruise <laughs> portion. You send something out, and by that night, you know if it worked. Try something else the next day and, and iterate. Um, and it's all funded in the name of kind of utter solar system research. And on, on the subject of funding, the other thing I, I thought of is uh, some work that we're just starting to do with NASA around um, planetary defense. So if I've understood correctly, you've got a way of creating multi-kiloton uh, explosions at relativistic speeds for any target you want 10 seconds after the launch. Uh, that, that's, that, that could be really useful. Uh, for <laughs> nudging that, or even that just was the people. original plan, I think. Yeah, so or also. even just the, the sheer power of the lasers <laughs> themselves could uh, nudge it in the right direction. So you should get it all just funded on that. I mean. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, um, I, I would like to point out that uh, we um, emphasize on any possible occasion that the purpose of this project is purely scientific because there is, of course, a, a policy issue of uh, some governments or individuals worrying about the potential use of this technology for as, as a weapon. And uh, uh, that's one advantage to having the beamer on Earth uh, because if it's in space, you can point it much more easily at targets. Yes, there are lots of hands, so I suggest just moving the, the Ball around yeah. geographically. Uh, you can throw it to that side, but you you were first. Go ahead. 
I just wanted to follow up on the uh, comment by Ruslan on uh, becoming a spacefaring civilization, something I wholeheartedly agree with. I'm, I'm Ed Liu from the P612 Foundation, former astronaut. And uh, I think that I, I want to sort of turn it around, which is um, can we, what are the characteristics of a spacefaring civilization that we might be able to use to detect them, right? Because, uh, you know, what kinds of problems must a spacefaring civilization overcome, and could those be detectable from great distances? An example one that we work on at P612 Foundation is prevention of asteroid impacts. So, um, at least on this planet here on Earth, we, we have a one kilometer asteroid hit us about every million years. That's large, ex generally accepted large enough to collapse any advanced civilization. So we have a clock here on Earth. Uh, if you have about a million years from the time you become a, you know, a, senti a advanced civilization, to solve that problem or else you, you get reset. Control, alt, delete it or whatever you want. Um, so you might begin to look for sort of signs of geoengineering on a large scale, like clearing out areas of asteroid orbits or things like that. Um, another example might be climate. Eventually, where a civilization gets large, big, and powerful enough, it begins to use a substantial amount of energy uh, uh, as compared to what the insulation is on the planet, and you, and you begin to affect climate and other things like that. So you might also look for um, signs of sort of geoengineering that must happen for a civilization you know, to reach that advanced state. So uh, mm -hmm. the, the question is back to you guys. What, you know, what things, or for the cold crowd, what um, are the signs of a spacefaring advanced civilization that has solved these types of issues, and could they be seen? Anyone would like to address that? Right. Jeff? So Ed's comment about the thermodynamic signatures is really important. We here on the Earth use about five hundredths of a percent. Uh, we generate five hundredths of a percent of the power that the Earth actually absorbs from the sun. And that's an unavoidable global warming problem, right? That energy eventually ends up as heat. Um, that's a number which is monotonically increasing. And it doesn't go away because we change what we do. Information processing, as it goes up, becomes a larger and larger fraction of that total power. So one of the signatures <coughs> of, of this growing advanced civilization is thermodynamic. And the kind of imaging that we talked about um, earlier yesterday, the rotational image, is a, is a it's a good way of looking for technology, and by the way, it's pretty unavoidable. The, yeah. the, the, the thermal signature that you talk about, Ed, um, is hard, hard to get rid of, right? I, I'm not sure that the geoengineering does it, but some of the other organization of, of a solar system to mitigate against the risk of, of catastrophic impact is the sort of thing that, that on a larger scale we, we probably ought to be able to figure out a way of finding. Jim? Uh, yes, yeah, so the ultimate thing and what you're talking about is to uh, the Dyson sphere, to enclose a star entirely and take all its energy and convert it into infrared uh, and use it all for your civilization, uh, although Dyson didn't really mean to go all that way. Uh, and the searches have been made for Dyson spheres, and anomalies have been found that are, do not seem to be too indicative. And another way to do things that would be noticed would be to seed stars and elements that wouldn't naturally occur there in some kind of a signature that could be seen when you're just doing astronomy. Uh, big scale stuff, uh, certainly you'd like to, to think it's observable. On the other hand, you've got to turn this question around and ask, would they want to be observed? Maybe we don't hear from them because they don't want to talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move well, on. That's another problem. I, yeah. yeah. I would okay. just add one more thing is that we can probably be pretty sure that they won't use chemical propulsion, right, because it's so no. inefficient, as, as Phil mentioned in his talk. And so signatures of photon propulsion or antimatter propulsion, whatever that looks like, or nuclear, something, we just know for sure it's not going to be chemical propulsion. It's just too inefficient. And actually, to follow it's on. It's too slow. It's just slow. too slow. Yeah. But to, to follow on, uh, on that, I think what we're talking about uh, is, uh, I mean, we're, we're assuming that these civilizations are going to be in some sense uh, like us or, or within the, the scope of what we can imagine uh, a spacefaring civilization would be. And I would argue that uh, what we can imagine only extends maybe, you know, like a few thousand years uh, in, into the future. And past that, we just have no idea what, what we would be like. 
And so if, if we pick a random time during kind of the, the uh, 10 billion uh, lifetime of, a, of an Earth-like planet, let's say, uh, the few millennia or even 10,000 years within that is such a minuscule uh, fraction that it is highly improbable that uh, we will overlap with another civilization over, over that range. And if we're talking about uh, millennia separating us from, from them, uh, we have no idea about what kind of technology they're gonna use or what will they be like or, or, or what kind of communication they, they, they will be doing. If you, if you consider uh, our civilization, you know, even a few hundred years of now, uh, uh, back in the past, had no real idea of like radio wave communications uh, and so on. I would think that uh, a thousand years from now or a few thousand years from now, we might not be communicating in radio waves, we might be communicating in um, dark energy waves or gravitational waves, neutrino waves or, or something for which we do not yet have a name or any concept. Um, so uh, I have a little bit of a pessimistic view on that because of, of that. It's, That's true. Yeah, the the million years. Absolutely, I, I agree. Yeah. I suggest we move on to, because there are lots of yeah. hands. Uh, go ahead. I, I just want. To, can you hear me? Yes. I just want to make or point out. I, I'm pretty sure that other people is aware of this, but um, as we have said, going to the nearest star is kind of the long-term goal, and then there is a full range of intermediate things that we can do with more massive, less massive. Um, I think that along these lines, and it's something that hasn't been discussed here, it would be nice to make a scientific roadmap um, for strategic goals that we can build over the next 30 years. <coughs> because if we can say that when we have a thousand lasers set up and built, we can start sending microprobes to Mars to start to take pictures um, continuously to deliver cargoes of a few grams in a couple weeks' times, that makes also a, a roadmap for funding in the long term. Because we have to go from 100 million, which is good to start with, but we have to go from that to 10, mi to 10 billion probably to build a full array. And it's not going to happen because somebody will put 10 billion on the table. Not 10 billion, you mean? I don't know, 10 billion or 10 trillion? No, we already have 100 million. Uh, 100 million. Uh, but how you right. go from that to... to, uh, that to the, the final system is expected to be too old, just make it more expensive. Yeah, so th that's the thing, but it, it, it's not going to happen just because we want to send star chips to another right. star. Um, it has said here to, to deliver cargo or whatever, but I think there's a, there's a possibility to actually make a roadmap for interstellar um, studies. For example, some non-trivial science cases happen at the gravitational ends of the sun. A lot of people know about this. When you travel far away from your star, you can do parallaxes of stars, or even, even galaxies. So you can do um, deep cosmology, for example. When you have a baseline of one parsec, take a picture of the same part of the sky, you will see parallactic motion at um, cosmological distances trivially, much easier than what you can do today with other things. So there are a number of science cases, things that can be built. I think we should, we should try to build also this roadmap of science um, applications or, um, I mean, that's the community that can do that. And I think it's something that maybe we have to start thinking about it and start writing papers as well. Definitely, and, and one of the interesting points is that basic science could benefit because tests of, for example, modified gravity theories uh, could benefit from that. We know, all know about the Pioneer anomaly and so forth. And having a spacecraft move so fast, so far away, would allow us to test gravity much better than before. Yeah. There are so many cases, but we are always tackling them. And there's a roadmap for the array, but there's no roadmap for the science. I think we should write it down. Right. Um, a couple of reactions to comments that were said. Uh, so this idea that ET would be communicating on something other than photons, I think that's likely. If you'd asked 200 years ago, there were great ideas for ET about building fires and geometric objects and using <laughs> mirrors, and, and they were great ideas at the time. And then when radio was discovered 100 years ago, Marconi and Tesla did radio experiments, and that was great. And uh, so that, what that means is that 200 years from now, uh, there could be something complete, completely unanticipated, tachyon, subspace communication. I think you were referring to Star Trek. So, but I don't, uh, but I think that, 
shouldn't really change. I think you got to do the best thing that you know how to do with the best physics that you understand. So if you told Columbus 500 years ago, don't bother to sail to India, just wait 500 years, there'll be airplanes, make your job a lot easier. Uh, that's true, but Columbus found something interesting. So I think you just got to do with the physics that you understand, even though it would be true. naive to think that yeah. there isn't any, you know, we know there's physics we don't understand, dark energy, dark matter. So, so I think you just got to, photons are great right now. There may be something better. So the other comment I had was, uh, uh, people talk about Dyson spheres. So Dyson and Kardashev's work has been extended. Um, Dyson sphere, uh, Dyson one is civilization harnesses energy that hits their planet. Dyson two harness energy from their whole galaxy. Uh, I'm sorry, Dyson two is harnessing that, energy no. from your star. star yeah. Dyson three is Kardashev. harnessing energy from your whole galaxy. Kardashev. It's Kardashev. 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 Yeah. Kardashev. 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 Uh, Kardashev four is the whole universe. <laughs> And Kardashev 5 is the multiverse. <laughs> I don't know what Kardashev 6 is. There is nothing. <laughs> Maybe not 5. Um, other comments or questions? There are lots of hands. So I suggest just deliver the box to whoever you like. Yeah. Cube, cube number Ooh. 2. <sighs> OK, Ray, go ahead. Max Planck Institute for um, Solar System Renee. Research. Yeah. As someone who's working on a trajectory optimization to Proxima and Proxima B, I was wondering if we could find some consensus in the panel as to how far from the planet you need to fly by to uh, make the best of your observations. Are we talking planetary radii? Are we talking AU? Anyone would like to take that question? Oh, I guess I can start with uh, how far. I think, uh, Phil, you, you had a slide uh, showing how large you know you need, for an aperture you needed to have uh, what the trade-off was between aperture and distance from the planet to be able to resolve it. And so if you can make your sail into a uh, aperture, uh, you know, four meters or whatever, then uh, you can still get a decent image even at like one AU away. Uh, you can think about uh, the kinds of images Hubble has of Mars and Jupiter. That's the kind of detail that we can get from a you know, multimeter type aperture at one AU type distances. So that would be great. If you're limited to like a one centimeter aperture or, or less, then you have to be um, like a hundredth of an AU. Um, so then you would have to really be very precise about your um, slowing down. <laughs> like Earth moon, and, Earth moon distance or something like that. Yeah. In which case you might hit it. Right, exactly. Well, I, I would add to that that I think the, your position in the, in the orbit is also important. So I'd, I'd advocate that you go such that you can look through the atmosphere to get a lot of photons and get some information mm -hmm. directly about the atmosphere as, as you pass. Um, I, again, I, I think if you're counting photons, you have a lot of information yet to be extracted from the machine that is remote sensing your remote sensing device. And, and Other comments? Be ignored. Go ahead, Rishan. I just wanted to circle back to something that um, Jim said about uh, perhaps if civilizations are sufficiently advanced, they actually hide themselves from us. Um, and just point out that a lot of the signals and things that we look for that we've been talking about are from the point of view of a civilization that hasn't figured out its energy needs. And uh, there's certainly plenty of examples from human cultures where actually the burning of superfluous resources and goods uh, it was an indication of power. And so um, if we think about it from a civilization that has addressed its energy needs and essentially has power to burn, um, then maybe some of these signals are not so out there. And in fact, um, the effort to uh, signal out into space something that we might detect is not so much about a wish to communicate, but as a demonstration of strength. Good comment. Other comments? So. Um, Picking up on the comment about the system of, of Starshot, there's a lot of places in Starshot that are very hard, as we know. And they're equally hard across the board, whether it's in the spacecraft or in the energy source and all of that. And so uh, I want to ask the panel, one, is there something that we really ought to focus on that will actually make Starshot easier? Uh, and suspecting that there's no simple answer to that, uh, picking up on the early comments, the interim steps that one has to go through. We're talking about, uh, 
we don't have a spacecraft now that's less than 100 kilograms that can really do interplanetary flight. And we want to get down to 10 kilograms, 1 kilogram, uh, 100 grams, 1 gram. Uh, you have scientific things you want to learn about the interstellar medium along the way. They can be learned with these interim steps of technology. So there needs to be a parallel uh, science and technology of interim steps. So unless, so I guess this is two questions. One is, is there a particular area that you think would make a breakthrough that would that make Starshot easier? And secondly, uh, do you have any ideas about those interim steps that you would uh, be able to take so that we can get off this uh, total focus on the impossible problems and start to build up some knowledge along the way to uh, make progress? Harry? Well, uh, so if you look at the sort of overall cost uh, uh, of the entire program, uh, I think, uh, Avi, you mentioned it, that <clears throat> essentially all of the cost is in the, uh, in the source, in the Beam. photon engine or uh, the laser itself. The entire project is predicated on the idea that that will follow an exponential cost reduction curve. That will happen, you know, what do we know about exponentially declining, uh, technologies that decline exponentially in cost? They have some uh, physical scaling uh, law that, such as Moore's law, that dictates that you get more function uh, through some uh, scaling process, uh, and that reduces the cost per function. <coughs> There's, and also, it growing the size of the market. So the, one of the things that we need to do is to find a way to uh, leverage uh, markets that are going to scale anyway. Uh, and uh, so uh, solid state devices have that characteristic. If we think about the fact that uh, you know, 10 years ago, none of you had a solid state device in your household, and now you have uh, solid state devices in, uh, I expect many of you uh, have replaced even your compact fluorescence with LED light bulbs, or if you haven't, uh, you'll do so very soon. Uh, so that's, that, that's a revolution that occurred, and that caused a vast uptick in the consumption of solid state <coughs> devices. That kind of thing is needed for the devices that form the unit elements of the laser that Phil talked about. Uh, in order to, to, to make that happen. So I think if I had to pick one thing, it would be finding a way to generate a couple of leapfrogs in the, in the design of the elements that would make this kilometer scale phased array laser possible. Any other comments? Yeah, I think uh, I completely agree with, with, with you. Uh, I think there's an uh, intimate link between Moore's law, which is necessary for, for Starshot, and uh, uh, the emergence of a market that drives that, that Moore's law. And I think uh, in particular, um, a, a market, uh, in some kind of markets in space are critical to, to, to drive all, all of this. And I think uh, what uh, will uh, determine whether you know, we'll, we'll have a market in space or not is whether uh, humans uh, become uh, more interested in space exploration or, or, or they give up on it and just decide to, um, to, to kind of uh, uh, do, do all of their affairs on Earth. So um, I, I, I think that uh, um, one critical thing to enable breakthrough Starshot is everyone's um, support of, of space development in one way or another, and, and maintaining interest in, in space. So, we, we, we got the, yeah. Let me break in and just mention that uh, I think there are actually some terrestrial markets that will actually drive the, uh, I mean, it's not a sure thing, but you can imagine this. Uh, let me give one example. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, we all look forward to the day when we can sit in the back seat of our car and let the car drive itself. In order to do that, you're going to have to have some range-finding device like a LiDAR system. That LiDAR system will probably have a few chips that have one-watt lasers. Uh, in the world, uh, last year, there were 70 million vehicles sold. So now, uh, essentially, if you have, uh, say, 10 lasers in a car, uh, one, 10, you're now at uh, a gigawatt of lasers in the entire vehicle fleet that's being sold worldwide. So there you're, you've got your first gigawatt. So if you can find examples like that, we might be able to do that on Earth even before we go to space. Yeah, that's true. Yes, uh, well, that's what made microwaves uh, cheap, uh, microwave ovens. 
the, uh, uh, to answer your question directly, Lou, one of the things you do in system analysis and system engineering is you look at risk reduction. You try to identify what are your risk areas and see whether or not you can develop a plan B or a plan C which alleviates that risk or at least prepares you if that risk becomes fatal. For example, if the problem is uh, the lasers, you look for another wavelength. If the problem is materials, you look for some way to change the mission specs so that materials can be built. If the problem is the sales stability, then you see whether or not the mission parameters or, so the, or the materials or something else can be changed to alleviate that. So I would favor, really, that programmatically, we try to you know, conceptually think of plans B, C, and D because you always want to have a backup plan. Last comment, uh, Blakesley. I would just say with Starshot, we should keep in mind two things. One is that why do we have Starshot as it currently exists, right? It's because of uh, current technology, right? So photon propulsion being <laughs> basically our only way forward as we know it now. And two, the exponential cost uh, decay and size decay of, uh, of uh, electronics and lasers, right? So that's why we have Starshot. And so we, we, we have a starting point, right? We know we can develop those technologies now. That's our starting point, right? That's one. The second thing, though, is to keep in mind that there's a lot of technologies that are uh, not matured yet, right? They're developing technologies, the material side of things being one of them. And so a lot of these systems problems may be solved by things that are just now on the forefront. So some examples of that could be, one way to really improve Starshot would be if you could have photon recycling. So instead of just one sail, right, and the laser shining on that sail, you could have a, a, another secondary mirror that would recycle photons between the, the primary sail um, and the recycler, which is stationary. Um, that would greatly increase the efficiency. You could have heavier payloads. You could achieve faster speeds, right? So that's that's one improvement. And maybe that will come from the material side or from some other technology. We're, we're looking at that in the program as a, as a way of making our experimental facility shorter, <laughs> recycling the photons. So, so, so just to keep in mind exactly that, that we have some technologies that we know right now, and we should start there, and then keep in mind the, the advances in other fields that are are not fully matured, but that are, are exciting. It has been a, definitely an exciting discussion. We reached uh, our time limit. Uh, I just wanted to point out that there is a chance that um, uh, our civilization, if, if Starshot is successful, our civilization will be complemented and, and Breakthrough Listen would, would get a signal saying, welcome to the Interstellar Club. Uh, <laughs> and so I'd like to close the panel discussion with this uh, thought. Thank you.